you know, taking the young person's rudy, man. I'm going to read my spiel right off my phone. <laughs> as long as I don't delete it. Um, can, I said, I think we're set to go. I can definitely hear myself. Uh, thank you all for coming very much. My name is Tony Donovan. I am uh, here. Um, well, we're all here tonight for an informational forum on the Central Maine Power Company's application for the New England Clean Energy Connect transmission line from Quebec through Maine to Massachusetts. My name is Tony Donovan. I am currently the chairperson of the Sierra Club Maine Executive Committee. Sierra Club Maine is one of 64 chapters of the Sierra Club nationwide. And as with all Sierra Club chapters, we are an entirely volunteer, grassroots environmental advocacy group. The Sierra Club is the largest and oldest environmental advocacy organization in North America. And in Maine, we have 5,800 members and over 14,000 supporters. And tonight, we're here for those supporters. We are here hosting this moderated forum to provide as much information as we can uh, for our members, for people, for groups, uh, to try to be able to make informed decisions on what is uh, certainly a very important energy project. I want to extend my thanks to the our thanks, Sierra Club thanks to the panelists, particularly the folks here from Central Maine Power, uh, with the understanding that they accept our invitation to this event that is specific to learning from all sides. We're not dominating it from any one side. Let's try to get some good questions on the table and some good answers and non-answers, and we'll mo move on to find them. So with that said, I asked for, and I'm certain we're going to get this a good main crowd, proper uh, meeting decorum and civility as requested by all. So I'm going to introduce our guest tonight, and uh, I'll start with CMP. And then I'll tell you a little bit about what the process is. Thorne Dickinson, Vice President of Business Development uh, for Avant Grid. Yep. Uh, Mr. Jerry Mirabelli. Mirabelli. Mirabelli, Environmental Programs and Projects, Central Maine Power. Uh, Bruce Phillips is Director for the Northbridge Group, who's here with Central Maine Power. Then we have interested parties or individuals representing interveners, if they're not actually interveners. Uh, Sue. Eli, Climate and Clean Energy Policy Advocate and Staff Attorney for the Natural Resources Council of Maine. Link Jeffers, Director of Economic and Community Development, City of Lewiston. Jeremy Payne is the um, Executive Director of the Maine Renewable Energy Association. And David Publicover is Senior Staff Scientist with the Appalachian Mountain Club. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Okay, we're going to thank you. The, um, so, okay, we'll have Central Maine Power is going to do about a 20 minute. We're trying to limit, I'll do my best on time. Yep. Watch my clock. 20 minutes uh, for a presentation. And then I'm going to assume that there'll be some pressing questions. But, so, so, we'll go open up to a couple questions when they're done, keeping in mind that we're going to open the whole thing up to questions and answers after everyone's done speaking. But if you really want to ask CMP something about their presentation, um, you know, please, I'll recognize you. Um, I'm going to try to keep it fair and balanced after the 20 minute presentation and Q, whatever Q&A that goes on, then each one of the uh, interested parties will do three to five minutes. You're going to try to limit it to 20 minutes. And then we'll open it up to uh, full questions and answers. And then, although I think I might have just lost my script, I should be able to do this off the top of my head because in keeping with full disclosure, Sierra Club, national organization of which the main chapter is a part of, is opposed to this project. The, our opposition is based on our opposition to Hydro-Quebec and mega dams um, as not being clean energy. Um, we can elaborate on this during the Q&A if you'd like, or you can contact us later. Uh, but we are here for a good understanding of what this transmission line is, like most of you. So um, there we go. And, um, let's get started. I think I'll turn it right over. Um, should, should we do introductions or is just John? I point to John. He's an old friend. I, John and I go way back. We're Islanders, by the way. Uh, John Carroll's probably going to do a little presentation, or you're the touch guy. He's going to drive. All yeah. yours. He's just going to well, drive. Well, this, this is John Carroll, so for anybody that... Uh, so uh, I, I'm really excited to be here, too. I, uh, I love this idea of the format, and I want to thank Dot Kelly for coming up to me. And uh, actually, uh, during, uh, during one of our um, sessions at, at the commission, uh, to, to have this idea, and I think it's really exciting. I think sometimes when we're in, we're in that litigated setting, or we're writing pieces, or... Uh, you know, sometimes it's harder to find common ground, and I think these are great opportunities to have this kind of a dialogue and answer questions. Uh, I think the, uh, the challenge that um, we, we, I think we're all dealing with, and I think the, the nice thing here is, I think everybody that most likely is here is in agreement that climate change is a, a threat that we have to wrestle with. And particularly if you believe it's an existential threat, 
that action has to be taken on it now. And um, as far as uh, um, as far as New England and uh, and Maine, uh, it's not the only challenge. We we to try to move to a de decarbonized future where we move our electric supply to a decarbonized side. We, we have other balancing factors that we have to do with. So not only about reducing CO2, but we're also um, looking at stabilizing prices and ensuring reliable supplies. I think many people that have lived in Maine for a number of years can remember particularly the winter of 2013 and 14, where there wasn't enough gas supply to reach uh, New England. New England paid $3 billion extra that winter. Maine itself paid over $300 million. So how do you balance all of these various issues? How do you deal with that challenge um, while still moving towards a decarbonized future? So um, I'm, I'm gonna kick it over to Bruce Phillips. Um, then I'm gonna come back and talk a little bit about our project. Um, Jerry uh, um, is gonna talk a little bit about the environmental and permitting and then I'll wrap it up. So um, Bruce Phillips has uh, been in the electric industry for over 30 years, uh, specializing in uh, policy and economics, and particularly in the last 10 years, he's focused on climate change issues, including work that he did at the Obama administration on cap and trade and clean power. So I think the, um, that idea, that perspective on more of a strategic and policy ways, I think is a great way to kick it off. Okay. Can everybody hear me? All right. Um, uh, thank you, Thorne, and thank you, Dot, and, and, and the Sierra Club for hosting this. Um, lo looking forward to the to discussion here at, at when, uh, when, the, when the panelists is done. Um, so, so to start with, um, you know, as, as Thorne said, I'm going to talk a little bit about the policy context for, for this project and the idea of bringing Canadian hydro into, into New England. Um, and the policy context for that is the climate challenge. And I'm going to talk a little bit about just what, what that means and uh, how difficult the challenge it, it is, it is to, uh, it, to, to, to surmount. Um, but, but let me say, because it's a large challenge, it's certainly very reasonable for, for all of us to be talking about what the best way to do that is uh, or what the best combination of ways to do that is. And certainly, uh, this project and bringing Canadian Hydro in, into Massachusetts is, is part of one approach to, to addressing the climate challenge. Uh, certainly it's not the only one. Uh, there are many people uh, around the country and, and maybe in this room that, that have the view that the way we ought to be addressing uh, the climate challenge is by decarbonizing the electric system exclusively with renewable energy technologies but without any sort of new reservoir hydro. And um, uh, I'm going to talk, and most of my focus here today will be on, on that pathway, really trying to um, explain to you some of my concerns about it and, and why, uh, in my view, that may not be a fully practical or assured way to achieve the policy goals of decarbonizing the power sector here in the next, the next several decades. So there's two particular pieces of that, um, two versions of this 100% renewables, no hydro um, approach that, that, are, that I'm going to examine in turn. Um, one is relying solely on, on solar energy, wind energy, and, and battery storage technologies just by themselves. Uh, and uh, the other is to rely on those technologies plus another complement of other kinds of renewable technologies and supporting technologies um, but ones that still exclude reservoir hydro. And I'm going to talk through some, some issues associated with all of those um, uh, uh, as a counterpoint to an alternative approach that would involve importing Canadian hydro in, into the United States. Um, thank you. Uh, so uh, first, before sort of diving in, in, into some of this, a few, a few points. So what does it mean to address climate change? Um, and what do we mean by decarbonization? Uh, and the specific goal that uh, policymakers have taken, and I think is part of the policy across the New England region uh, as context for this project, and those of us that are policy analysts working on this, um, deep decarbonization means eliminating carbon emissions from the global economy by roughly mid-century. Um, so this, you know, in contrast to the Obama Clean Power Plan, that sought to reduce electric sector power emissions by about 30 percent. 
the true goal is to eliminate it, to fully take it down to zero and do that by mid-century. And so what, what the global climate modelers tell us is that means by 2060 to zero out global emissions, almost everybody sees the electric sector as being having to do first because it's the cheapest and fastest way to do that. So that means eliminating all carbon emissions from the power sector in roughly 30 years. And I'll just say that that's, that's, that's a challenge that has never been done before in the history of humankind. Uh, so it's, 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 a, it's an extremely difficult challenge. A few uh, sort of data points for context here in New England. Uh, what this means is that um, at a minimum we have to replace about 42% of the electric generation in the region that's currently supplied by natural gas and, and, and oil. 68% um, if we're also going to replace all the nuclear generation in, in the region. 97% if we're actually going to do it all with solar and wind and battery storage. Uh, and so it's a, it's a tremendous <coughs> investment um, that has to happen uh, and, and has to happen very rapidly. Um, so uh, as, as I mentioned, roughly mid-century means 2050, 2060, the electric sector by 2050. Um, and, and what the energy historians tell us is that in the history of humankind, we've only gone through two other grand technology transformations. One is from wood to coal, and the other is from coal to oil and gas. And you can argue, since we're still using a lot of coal, uh, we haven't really gone through any f transition fully, but each of those transitions takes 50 to 75 years. And what we're trying to do here is we're trying to compress that into a 30-year time period. Um, so among other things, what this means is that we only have one chance to get this right. If we had 200 years to address the climate problem, we could take the next 30 or 40 years, try something, see if it worked, and if it didn't, that's okay, because you still have another 150 years to sort of figure out what plan B is, plan C is. That's not the situation we're in today. You know, we really only have one chance, and so we have to make sure that not only that we're undertaking technology paths that are possible, but that they are reasonably likely or assured to actually achieve what, what they're intended to do. So, next slide. So, um, I mentioned I'm going to sort of talk about two parts of this. Um, Next, some of these slides are pretty dense and, and technical. Um, I'm going to skip all of them pretty quickly, but I'm happy to talk about them further uh, later today or, or at another time if I gloss over some points or raise issues that, that aren't addressed here. So I'm going to present some data that uh, is taken from how the electric system in New England operated in, in 2017, just last year. This is sort of daily and hourly and weekly data over the course of, of last year. And I've selected a couple, couple weeks to look at in detail. Um, the analysis is done over the entire year. Happy to share the entire analysis. But to make these points, I'm just going to focus on a couple of these representative weeks, once in the winter and once, once in the summer. So this is, what, this is what these weeks look like in these charts. If you look at the yellow line at the bottom, that's the amount of solar energy that we produced in, 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 in New England um, in this time. And you can see in the top chart that there's a peak every day of the week. Uh, there's some solar output every day of the week. We have uh, the first day, the third day, uh, the fifth and sixth days, you know, are good, pretty good solar days. A couple of the other days, less so. Uh, so some days are sunny, some days are cloudy, not, not that surprising. Um, the heavy green line, which is easiest to see on the top chart, is the sum of the wind and the solar output. And so you can see how that sort of peaks up and down, uh, as you would expect, consistent with the solar output. But there's a couple days at the beginning of the week which are, which are both pretty quiet from a wind perspective and also kind of cloudy. So um, it's, it's variable um, ac across the week. We have a similar pattern down below uh, in the lower chart. Um, and, and the difference between the two charts that's notable that comes across here is that the wind resource is much stronger in the winter than in the summer. So the lines are there are much, much uh, um, much higher on, on the top chart than the lower chart. Next slide. Um, this point, this, uh, this chart simply puts that same data in the context of electric load um, to make the point and remind all of us that solar and wind today only comprise 3 to 4 percent of electric generation in the region, despite how fast they've been grown. Next chart. 
This one's a little complicated, but, but I'm going to try to simplify it a little bit. So what we've done here is we've taken the solar and wind daily output from last year, and we've expanded it so it produces the total number of megawatt hours equal to the electric load uh, that New England had last year. And we want to see whether, uh, whether, whether the solar and wind output matches with, with the electric load. That is, how, what portion of the year are we producing enough power to satisfy electric load? So in the top chart, that black line running through the middle is electric load. The, the top line there is, is the sum of the solar and wind grossed up 35 times, more or less, to equal the total amount of output over the course of the entire year. The green or turquoise shaded area up top is the hours in which we have surplus generation. Uh, and you see, we don't actually have surplus generation every, year, every, every hour during this week. There's a couple days early on where we have deficits. More importantly, if you look at the chart at the bottom, the tanned area is an extended period during the week when we do not have enough electric generation out of, of the solar and wind to satisfy load. Even though we have enough over the course of the entire year, the variability of the resource is such that we don't have enough to satisfy it every, every week or every, or every day of this, of this season. So we have these, this mismatch. And just to make sure you understand, I didn't cherry pick these weeks to sort of find two that, that don't match pretty well. Let's go to the next chart. Um, this shows the equivalent output over the course of the entire year. And what you see here is that um, beginning in the winter and extending into the spring, we have extended periods of surplus energy. This is when we have enough to meet load, but we're producing a lot of electricity that has no economic value, so it's wasted energy. Um, we see this again in, in the fall that comes up, and in the, but in the summer, we have the real problem, and that's where um, we, we don't have enough output out of the solar and wind uh, capacity to meet electric load. Uh, and so this pattern of surpluses in the winter and, and deficits in the summer is not unique to New England. We see this in every state uh, and region of the lower continental 48 states, um, with the possible exception of California. And that's because it has a stronger summer, summer wind resource than winter. So we have this problem. Uh, and then if we skip forward here, uh, next slide. I will say that every serious climate policy analyst that I've talked to in the papers I've read in, in, across in, in, in the literature on this, acknowledges this problem, that we, could, we literally cannot solve this problem with solar and wind and battery storage. It's an impractical solution. So what do we look to next? Well, we look to coupling those technologies with other kinds of renewable technologies and supporting technologies that can help us address this seasonal mismatch issue. And this list of nine technologies here is from probably the most uh, well-recognized or most prominent analysis that's been done of this problem to solve the, the seasonal. And this, so it calls for onshore wind, offshore wind, solar PV, concentrated solar power storage, battery storage, pumped hydro, thermal energy storage, a nationwide high voltage transmission system, uh, and customer demand response. And customer demand response is a euphemism both for sort of shifting <coughs> customer demand from one hour to the next as might be done with electric vehicles, it also covers curtailment. You know, it's curtailing electric load when it's not available to meet industrial load or commercial load or residential load. And what's important about this list is not the particular technologies here. It's that there's nine items on it. We're not talking about three or four or five technologies here. We're talking about nine. And the other thing that's important about it is that we need all nine of them. You take out any one of these, and the whole system kind of falls apart. And so, but if you ask me today on a piece of paper, can we create a situation where those nine technologies could satisfy load? I think the answer is yes. You know, so the answer here is not whether it's possible to do this. The real question should be, is it likely, is it assured? Because remember, we only have one chance to do this. We can't try one path have it fail, and then take another 50 years to sort of find another solution. Next slide. Um, so a few points here uh, about why there's uncertainty associated with this. Um, I'm not going to sort of deal with these in, in, uh, um, in any detail, but let me just sort of tick through them to give you a little bit of flavor. Can we build out the wind and solar technologies? Can we scale it up 35-fold across the region to produce all the megawatt hours we need? That's one question. Uh, can we produce a much larger nationwide high-voltage transmission network? 
given the cost of doing that, the institutional challenge, the public reaction? That's another question. A third question is, can we, can we invent and commercialize the multi-week and seasonal storage technologies that we need to move surplus energy from the winter to the summer? Uh, fourth, can we do the demand management and load curtailment program, curtailing electric load for customers? Will customers be willing to have their electric loads managed in that way? Will they be happy with that or not? Um, and finally, can we do all of that and achieve zero emissions at a cost that cut rate ratepayers are willing to pay for in the real world? And so those are all questions. And in theory, we might be able to address all of them. Um, and, uh, but what this next slide does is that it puts those questions into a risk framework. <clears throat> and if you recall, what I said is that we had to have all nine of those technologies to achieve this kind of outcome. This figure arranges those five questions um, in, in that same kind of format. And, and what's important about, about this chart is the, the basic observation is that um, if we had, if we could answer uh, with 100% certainty that we could achieve all five of those questions, answer all five of those questions in the affirmative, then we would know that we could affirmatively uh, decarbonize the power sector. Uh, but if you start to move back from 100% probability to some lower level, then the cumulative probability of getting the outcome is a product of all five. And so in this particular little mathematical example, if you assume we have a 90% chance of being able to answer all five of those questions affirmatively, um, then we have a 59% chance of, 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 uh, of, of success. Uh, and when I show this to other climate policy analysts, they, they kind of uh, smirk and, and laugh, and, and then they say 59% is way too high. You know, under the best of circumstances, it might be 50%. It might be a coin flip, whether, whether that path is feasible or not. Next slide. <laughs> so, um, so what do we do about that? I think the solution is to, is to add other technology options to the mix. Um, and uh, what this slide illustrates is that if we have three other technology paths that we can use, not instead of solar and wind and batteries, but in addition to solar and wind and batteries, the probability of this little exercise goes up dramatically. And with three other alternatives in this exercise, the chances of success goes from 59% to 95%. So, um, uh, you know, it kind of argues for resource, this argues for resource diversity and pursuing all of the zero carbon technology options that we have. So just, just in closing, a few, few quick takeaways. Um, the seasonal mismatch that I illustrated in the first part of this, 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 this set of slides is a serious problem. Uh, because of that, the solar and wind and battery storage approach is not a practical solution by itself. I think most serious climate policy analysts would agree with that. Um, we can address this seasonal mismatch by coupling solar and wind and battery technologies with, with other zero carbon technology options as well. Um, uh, but if, if we do that with a limited, limited scope, like the nine technologies I listed earlier, uh, the probabilities of success are pretty low. They're certainly not as high as they should be. And we can do better than that. And we can do better than that by folding in other zero carbon technology options. And because of that, this last bullet here is that a more practical and assured way to achieve the climate policy goals is to decarbonize with a broad range of technologies, including what we have available to us here in New England, uh, Canadian hydro, reservoir hydro. So let me, let me stop there. So yeah, well, thank you, Bruce. I was going to, uh, we do have other slides, but I think to honor the time of, that we have here, there are, uh, maybe I could just, if I, I could ask the patients for one minute, we'll go right to the, maybe to the last slide that we have. There is other information in the deck about how we laid out the project, some of the mitigation things that we have some visuals around the transmission line that you can look. Oh, go ahead. I, I'd really like to see um, the mitigation and, and that kind of thing, so I really don't want you to pass through okay. that, because that's the information we all need. Well, actually, that was a pretty good snapshot. Thank you. I personally got a good snapshot of, your, of what you were saying there, and I do understand there's a little bit more to add, but let's see if we can get some questions and information out on the table and get to it and share with you what else you have. I did punch another minute up there, but. What's that? I did punch another minute up there for you, but. 
oh. 34 seconds with my interruption. So, what, so the, go ahead. So what I, I, I think why I want to make sure that we're acting in good faith, that was the idea here of the, of the thing. I, I, I sense that should we do the, <laughs> these few slides and, and then go, go out, or should, how do we want to do that? I don't want to. Look to me, I thought Bruce was interesting, but it, it really had nothing specific about the project you're doing. So I think, in fairness to people who don't know, okay. we should go through what you All right. Well, why don't we do this? We'll do a, an abbreviated, quick version of it so we make sure we hit all the key points. And then the whole team is available afterwards if you have more questions or obviously if questions come up uh, during the process. So um, as, I, as I kicked off at the beginning, the challenges that we have as both New England and Maine and really globally um, are around not only reducing greenhouse gases, but um, stabilizing prices and, and dealing with uh, supply of, of of uh, reliability supply. Massachusetts, Massachusetts took a leader posi position by uh, passing legislation to um, have a request for proposal to propose projects, 51 were submitted into them, around reduction of greenhouse gases. Uh, obviously, I think for most people that are following it very closely, Northern Pass was initially selected. Their, um, their um, permitting process failed in New Hampshire, and we were the the, the second place out of the 51 that moved forward to the top. Um, let's go ahead. So the, I think the thing that we, we like to talk about is how we, the philosophy about how we laid out the project. Uh, you'll see this, this is a map that we also have outside. Of the 189 miles of the corridor, 72% of it is parallel to an existing line. If you look at the map outside, you'll actually see the blue line from Lewiston, just short of the forks. Uh, that is the part of the line that's parallel to the existing corridor. And the new corridor is from uh, the Forks area uh, west to the Quebec border. And how we tried to think about that was, uh, number one, to identify the most sensitive areas from conservation easements and areas that we knew had uh, large visual impacts and, and try to find a corridor through that. In addition, we tried to find land that was similar utilization as a transmission line would be uh, and as Jerry will talk a little bit about, the, the two uh, largest landowners are here are, are logging companies, and, and that's an area west of the forks that's uh, heavily logged. Okay, so this shows um, in brown the large land parcels, and you know the preference would be a straight line, but we took many jogs around different sensitive resources, and the large land parcels allow us to do that because we can work with one landowner rather than having to talk to a number of different parties. And the white circles you see identify um, water bodies, wetlands, um, elevation, elevated areas uh, around Route 201, which is a scenic byway, um, vernal pools, uh, conservation lands, which is, are the, uh, the green, and then also the Kennebec River and the Appalachian Trail. And the idea here is that we did uh, natural resource surveys before we cited the, the, uh, the project. And made a point of avoiding them. There were many other diversions on a smaller scale, at a micro scale. This just shows examples of each type of diversion. Uh, this is what a rafter might see um, heading downstream from Harris Dam as it approaches the um, river crossing. The river crossing, uh, the aerial crossing proposes about eight miles south of uh, Harris Dam. It's not in the gorge proper. The gorge actually extends only about three and a half miles below Harris Dam. Um, in this area where the river flow is typically around six miles per hour or so, you'd see it for about two and a half minutes um, leading to it from upstream. And if a person turned around on a the raft, they'd see it for another five minutes or so um, looking upstream. And um, in this area, um, we've done a few things to minimize its impact, uh, one of which is to go to a three-pole design so that the wires are higher over the river. We've gone to non-specular conductors, which reflect less light, so they blend more into the skyline. And we've used uh, self-weathering steel, which is, is color-wise a bit more compatible with the woods because it looks kind of brown and rusty. This shows where the Appalachian Trail crosses the corridor in three different locations. Um, the, there is an alternative to cross it only once, and the trail, National Park Service has had the option to uh, modify the trail crossing and to reduce it from three to one. Uh, up to this point in time, they haven't done that. We're working with them now to look at options for uh, eliminating those first two crossings in the upper left of the 
um, aerial and reducing it to one to minimize the impact on hikers. And then this is a snapshot of the environmental impacts of the project and the compensation that we've offered as part of our compensation plan to the Army Corps of Engineers and Maine DEP. And <coughs> excuse me, what you'll see is that um, it breaks it out into some broad categories, temporary wetland fill, which is really a protective measure to protect wetlands as we traverse them with construction equipment. Those are crane mats. Um, different conversions of cover types, so forested wetlands, 156 acres, um, total land conversion of about 200 acres, and then permanent wetland fill of 11.4 acres over about 190 miles. So 258 or so acres of wetland impact, uh, permanent and temporary over that distance. In addition to that, um, we've offered an in-lieu fee because these are unavoidable impacts after we, after we avoided all the impacts we could. And the amount of money due based upon the formulas at the state and federal level t for those unavoidable impacts is something around $4.2 million. Uh, we have also proposed six land parcels um, as compensation so that those land parcels will be protected in perpetuity. Um, three of which are within the Dead River uh, watershed, which is an outstanding river segment, and three in other locations, but they're all in close proximity to the, uh, the project and its impacts. Uh, and this is, a, uh, this is uh, showing what a clearing would look like before the line was constructed. Um, it would be a 150-foot wide clearing. Actually, I think this one's wider, and then you go to the next one. And this is what it would look like. Um, that's the type of structure, average height of 93 feet. Um, this one is around 80 feet. And what this photo simulation shows is five years after the initial clearing for construction, you get a lot of low shrub growth um, that softens the visual impact um, from the viewer's perspective. And maybe, John, just go back one slide, if you don't mind, the one more minute. Yeah, so the, this is actually the before shot. So this is not a, a simulation of the clearing. Uh, this is a, actually what the, the current um, land looks like, and, the, and that post one, as you said, is a, the line plus five years of growth. Let's go to the benefits. Yeah, so, so this is the, we've, we've redone the slide for anybody that's seen our presentation before to try to be more um, um, descriptive, both the recognition of the impacts associated with the project and the benefits. So um, from an impact perspective, we recognize that, um, and obviously there are visual impacts on recreation and scenic resources, wetland and wildlife disturbance. There's uh, disruptions with, uh, from construction activity. Uh, those are the kind of very near-term and tangible ones. On the long-term perspective, uh, less tangible, you have uh, impacts associated with First Nation regions in, in Quebec. Uh, you have uh, impacts on uh, the, the reservoir hydro related to CO2, mercury, and methane, uh, changes um, in the community resources in, in those areas, and uh, also for, for our project changes in wildlife habitat within the corridor. So those are, those are things that have to be balanced then against the benefits associated with the project to, for everyone to kind of make their own determination about how they feel. So one of the, one of the benefits is jobs. We've talked about uh, 1,700 jobs on average over the five-year construction period. Property taxes for the towns that are along the corridor, about 18 million a year. Lower energy costs, which we estimate for, for Maine, uh, all the Maine customers to be 40 million per year over the, the, the uh, contract period of the agreement. Uh, enhanced reliability, supply, and uh, op opportunity for economic development. And of course, in addition to all the reduction in um, uh, carbon, which we, we estimate in our analysis at uh, about 3 million metric tons um, annually for New England. Um, on the long-term perspective, you have a timely response to climate change, further development of the dispatchable resources, cleaner air, uh, price stability, regional economy, um, a public policy initiative moving forward as some of the things that Bruce had talked about uh, and uh, regional collaboration. The last slide is just uh, the final thing, which Thank is you. just a picture of... That was good, though. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's fine, yep. It was very good. And so, uh, fair and balanced, I went into this on, so I'm really trying to... That was good, thank you. You yeah. got about 35 minutes out of that 20, so... Okay. You <laughs> squeezed... Sorry your, about that. You squeezed your energy. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to give, I'm going to put my timer on three minutes, so I'll take a few questions, you know, directed to what you just saw. And remember, we're going to come back to this, um, but then my timer is on. Let's, uh, you had your hand up first. Yeah, sure. Um, Nick, could you say your name? Yeah. Actually, podium, please. I'm sorry. So that you get on 
I should have said that. We're going to get you on film, and so if, I would appreciate it if you're going to speak. You can get to the podium, and maybe if you want to ask a couple questions, now you can get behind them. Sure. The mood I'm a little bashful, so uh, putting me on camera might be a challenge. But uh, Jeff McCabe, resident of uh, the municipality of Skowhegan, a uh, lot of fun facts there. Lost most of them, really just uh, trying to figure out some of the impacts. Your slide in regards to the actual uh, visual impact, there was some communication or, you know, sort of time-wise, how long that visual impact would be. What are we talking about for distance? Uh, that showed, in, in the view of our visual consultant, Dewan Associates in Yarmouth, um, that showed what vegetation that had been trimmed more or less to ground level would look like in height and density in about five years. From, okay, so, from the so what's the visual impact as far as distance-wise on the river? Both upstream and downstream. Oh, oh you're talking about the Canterbury River crossing now? Yeah. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. So the, say, ask again. So where the transmission line crosses the Kennebec River, what are we talking about for a visual impact distance-wise? Yeah, it would be, um, I think, a quarter mile upstream and a half mile downstream of the crossing is where, from the water, from the rafters yep. or boaters' perspective, you'd be able sure. to see it. Sure. You wouldn't see the structures, you would see the wires, and the closest they would approach the water is 200 feet above the water. Um, and, and also, when you're crossing beneath the line, you know, in line with it, um, if you looked to the northwest yep. or to the southeast, you wouldn't see the structures because there are significant buffers of several hundred feet on each side of mature vegetation that can be retained because the wires are so high above the water. But in initial construction, that vegetation would not be cleared to the water? It would water. not be okay. cleared, no. It would not be cleared if we went back to that graph. Another question, too, in regards to, I'll be briefer on this one, I, I think. Uh, so the discussion about the parcels of land being exchanged in the Dead River Corridor, uh, the conservation easements, is there someone that's lined up to take those easements currently? Is there an organization or somebody that's already in line to get those easements in that property? Or? No, we have not identified recipients yet. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Becky Bartovic, um, Sierra Club. I uh, live in North Haven. Um, I have a, a lot of questions, but um, I wanted to just uh, a couple of things. Um, no net loss of wetlands is the Clean Water Act, um, is what the Clean Water Act says. So you've got um, a large number, 200 acres of wetlands um, in a state that relies on our hydrology for our um, habitat. Um, the in lieu fee doesn't do anything for saving wetlands. It just puts money in a bank that might buy some land that was, you know, already, we were already losing wetlands. How do you, how do you answer that in terms of climate? Because it's, it's going to affect the climate if we lose wetlands. Right. Well, a couple of things. The, the money that goes into the inlu fee, which is significant, is aggregated by um, the state, as you probably know. And um, they identify the areas that are most at risk and most ecologically valuable and purchase land in those areas. What we say with respect to wetlands is that we acknowledge that there's a lot, that they're clearing of wetlands, so a lot of um, forested wetlands will be converted to scrub shrub wetlands. And that is not a loss of wetlands, it's a, it's a change of functions and values, and that change of functions and values is, is explained in detail in the main DEP and the Army Corps applications, so that um, certain species that typically live in wooded areas will not utilize those areas afterwards, but species that live in more scrub, shrub habitat would. So that's, that's one. Okay, and so the second question, the shrub, the sh yeah, just second question, and I'll sit down. Um, this shrub habitat that's along the corridors, do you not intend to keep those corridors open for maintenance of the, of the transmission lines? We would have to keep them open, and they would be maintained in that, in a permanent state in the scrub shrub. So initially we clear them of the trees that are capable of growing into the conductors and then from that point forward we would keep them in a scrub shrub habitat permanently. With with chemicals or how are you doing that? We would that? initially cut and then we would treat the stumps to reduce uh, stump, spr stump sprouting and then we would treat with herbicides with uh, hand pressurized. Herbicides in wetlands, that's my point. Not in wetlands, no. Oh, you're no, you're we building would, wetted, forested wetlands. Right. We, we would not spray in wetlands. Tony, can I ask a quick question? Are, are we, yeah, are we going to be a first an opportunity to ask I will, questions, or when is? Cross my mind that you, okay. well, it's fresh in your mind. You want to? So you'll, you'll no, I'm happy to wait. She can feel free. I just have some well, questions. You can ask those, if you like, right now. okay. No, go ahead, please. 
Could we see the slide um, of the river, the, the view that's said to not be important or attractive with the lines going across? We need to switch over the... <laughs> there, there it is. <clears throat> I've been going to your meetings and I don't feel that your photos truly represent what we'll actually look at. I've worked on that river for 21 years and I can tell you that we're on that area a lot more than five to seven minutes. But I just wanted to let you know that that's a place where a lot of wildlife is seen every day. Eagles, there's deer, there's moose, it's a popular fishing spot, it's where the cold stream comes in. Um, and I think that it's being really misrepresented by you by saying it's not an important part of the river. Um, the gorge goes by quickly. This is where we spend our time. Um, it's when I come around that corner each day, I say to my guests that that's my favorite part in the river. And I'm, I know I'm not the only guide with that sentiment. And I just wanted to make sure that you're aware of that because you guys really downplay it. So I just wanted to make sure you knew that. Oh, I'm Kimberly Lyman. I live in Caratunk. Kimberly, these little rounds between, if we just stick to a specific question and get an answer, okay. and then plenty of time, I promise you, for um, raising points after we get a question. Okay, up. sorry. We'll try to nail those good questions based on what they just presented. Can you tell me then, this is a question, what do you use to spray um, the corridors to keep them down? Because they definitely currently do not look like that picture you showed. They're brown and they're dead. Um, right. So um, I can't tell you off the top of my head the chemicals that we use. It's a, it's a mix of chemicals. Um, when they are sprayed initially every four years, they, they, they look brown and dead. Um, but I can tell you that over time, when you know, we have capable and non-capable vegetation, the capable can grow into the conductor safety zone. Those are trees that are tall at maturity. And then non-capable vegetation is like shrubs that would not have to be cut or, or sprayed because they never grow tall enough. And over time, we use less herbicides because the treatment favors the non-capable vegetation at the expense of the capable because they take a foothold and they, they tend to take over. So, um, and they're, they're all hand pressurized. They're not broadcast, but individual specimens of capable trees are sprayed so that it's not aerial and it's not done um, in a way that would produce drift off-site. In fact, there's a standard at the state level that um, aerial spraying cannot occur when, when speeds are 15 miles per hour, wind speeds are 15 miles or greater. We apply that to our ground-based crews voluntarily to absolutely minimize drift off target. Thank you. And I just want to add to that I, if, if um, Jerry was describing the river, um, I don't know if you, I mean, I, I, don't, I, I don't want to have anybody leave with an implication that we don't understand how important the Kennebec River is. And obviously that's an important part of the dialogue with the DEP. We're looking at different alternatives, including a buried uh, approach across. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can you answer any specific question? Well, no, I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew that. Yeah, okay. That's why. Stick to questions and answers in this brief amount of time. And Jeremy, you mentioned you Fair. made a question. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so I'm, I'm hearing some pretty definitive numbers, $4.2 million for mitigation. I think we've all read $22 million potential settlement for some of the rafters. Maybe $40 million in ratepayer benefit. I'd be really interested in what information you can provide to us. I think most people who are in the world know that natural gas is what sets the price. So it'd be interesting to know where you're projecting natural gas prices to go in terms of delivering those $40 million um, uh, benefits to main ratepayers. And then speaking of specific benefits, I'd like to know um, publicly what do you expect CMP's profit to be from this line? So which, do I address all of the points? Are you answering the question? What's why, don't we start from the, why don't we start from one end and go back to the other? Okay. Profit right. projections? So the, the, uh, you know, we have not yet disclosed what our earnings will be for the company. Um, the, that will definitely have at a point in time. When we do that, it has to be done uh, because we're a publicly traded company on a fair disclosure to, to everyone. So that's something that the investment community has also not been communicated to. And when we do, we'll, we'll, com we'll communicate that. And the $40 million is based on? The 40 million is a production cost simulation. There were, I think, three models um, that were put into the Public Utility Case Commission uh, proceeding for estimations. Uh, the, uh, I, I believe the generator group had a one-year model that was, came in pretty much in line with ours for the first year. Uh, London Economics 
I was hired by the Public Utility Commission and had a lower number. So 40 million is our estimate. It's to your point, it's based on what forward gas prices are gonna be, what load is, what things are. It is, a, it is an estimate associated with forward production costs. That good? I had like six others, but I don't wanna. Yeah, no, you're gonna get a chance though, plus a presentation, which I may go to right now. So we've, we've done you know, a couple quick questions between, thank you very much. That was useful for me. I hope it was for everyone else. Jeremy, would you like to start? I'll give you five minutes, maybe even a little more. Sure. Now, I'll be pretty short and sweet because I think at least I find the most benefits sort of the Q&A exchange. I think that's probably what most people would like to hear rather than us talk at you. Um, so I'm Jeremy Payne. I'm the executive director of the Maine Renewable Energy Association. Uh, we're a trade association based in Augusta made up of renewable energy generators. So wind, solar, hydro, biomass, waste to energy, title, storage. Um, so in terms of who, who is that and what is that in Maine, that's um, it's about $3 billion of total investment in the last 15 years. Um, that's about 1,500 megawatts of clean, green, renewable power made here in Maine. And that represents about 2,500 jobs to Mainers. Um, uh, paying about $22, $23 million annually in property taxes. So we have pretty significant concerns about what this line could mean for existing and future renewable development. Um, also sort of puzzled by the discussion around reliability. Um, you know, we, I think most people are aware that we produce more electricity in Maine than we consume, which is great, much in the same way we do with blueberries, lobsters, and lots of other commodities. And that's, that's a good thing, potatoes, paper. Um, but I'm not sure why Maine uh, would, would benefit from a greater reliable system that is ultimately benefiting Massachusetts. And I obviously understand we're part of a regional power grid. And so the implications for Massachusetts do have an impact on Maine as well. But we certainly don't have a reliability issue in Maine anytime soon. Um, we're also really concerned about congestion. So when you put, think of it, think of sort of transmission lines as, as a highway. You put more cars on a road, you're going to see more traffic. So we're certainly concerned with the potential impacts of bumping off existing Maine-made clean electricity, mostly from biomass and hydro is what's most likely going to be bumped off. We have real concerns about what this line is going to do to those facilities, and in particular, some of the upgrades that will be required for sort of the next folks who are at the plate. Who comes forward who wants to develop the next storage project, the next tidal project, the next grid-scale solar project? By, by this line potentially taking up whatever excess headroom is left on these transmission lines, what is, what is the next person to the plate going to have to pay to make sure that they're able to effectively, efficiently, competitively connect their clean energy project? Um, we have a lot of concern about whether this is actually clean. Um, you know, I, I read with great interest a lot of the, the forums that have gone on, uh, a lot of the activities that the Public Utilities Commission, to me, that, you know, there's two letters that are missing at every single one of these, and that's HQ. You know, Hydro-Quebec should be here. They should be at the Public Utilities Commission. They should be here. They should be in Farmington. They should be in Jackman. They should be telling us what specific electrons will be delivered into, through, and ultimately into Boston. We don't know what's going to be coming through. So far, we're sort of asked to just trust us, and no disrespect to anybody here at the mic or at, at, uh, behind the podium here, but, um, or the horseshoe, rather, but I, I would argue that given some of the challenges that CMP is facing right now, I don't think you're really in a position um, to credibly say just trust us as it relates to the electrons, as it relates to the ratepayer benefit, as it relates to the impacts on the environment. Um, and I think just sort of the last thing I would want to say just to reiterate is, you know, we're not opposed to renewable energy. Obviously, that's what this trade association that I work for does. We want to see more clean, green electrons. We just want them to be... Um, generated in Maine, of course, but what we would like is specific, clear public evidence that this project will not harm existing or future renewable development in Maine. Thank you. Get four more minutes. <laughs> no, that's enough. Thank you. Um, Sue, would you like to go next? Um, and again, we'll save questions and we'll direct them after these, after you three give you. All right. So my name is Sue Ely and I'm the clean energy and policy, clean energy policy staff attorney for the Natural Resources Council of Maine. The Natural Resources Council of Maine is a nonprofit <coughs> member uh, based organizations. We, we have over um, 20,000 members and supporters in the state of Maine. Um, and we work on a variety of issues. Um, my 
primary um, area of interest is, is clean energy for the state of Maine. Um, the Natural Resources Council of Maine is um, an intervener at the Public Utilities Commission um, where CMP's proposed transmission line is um, looking to get a certificate of public convenience and necessity. We're also interveners in the Department of Environmental Protection and the Land Use Planning Commission procedures. Um, as of right now, no hearings have been set there, but, but the process has started. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions about the, the process there at either the PUC, the DEP, or the LUPC. Um, there's also a, 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 um, a process happening down in Massachusetts where the Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities is evaluating the contracts between Hydro-Quebec and the energy distribution companies down in Massachusetts. We are not interveners there. Um, we did submit testimony. I'd be happy to share that with anybody who's interested. Um, but that, just so for your awareness, there's a, a process going on there too. Um, the Natural Resources Council of Maine is opposed to this project. We have three primary reasons why we're opposed. The first is the site impacts. Um, as CMP mentioned, this line is gonna bisect Maine. It's going, um, I think the statistic that Thorne gave was 72% of the line is, is running on existing corridors. Um, <clears throat> that means that there's 53 new miles that are gonna be cut through Maine's North Woods. 53 miles, 150 feet wide with new towers, an average of 90 some odd feet tall. Um, so that's a really big impact to, to Maine. Um, Maine's North Woods is the largest undisturbed forest east of the Mississippi. It's incredibly important to wildlife um, it has deer wintering areas, inland wading water fowl areas, um, vernal pools. Um, there's just a there's just an incredible amount of biodiversity up here that is going to be impacted by this, and the science is just continuing to grow about the impacts that come from fragmenting these types of forests. Um, CMP says that. Um, that these forests have been cut over. We have a we have a robust logging industry here in the state of Maine. That's not a terrible thing. Um, and what happens when you cut a forest is it grows back. Um, what happens with these transmission lines is that Central Maine Power cuts them and then maintains them in a cut state and sprays herbicides. Um, so you're going to have ongoing habitat impacts. It's very difficult for species to cross those long um, lines. Great for predatory birds, snatching lots of small creatures. Um, it really disrupts the ecosystem. And so that's, that's one. We're really concerned about these impacts. There's also site impacts. We have a scenic byway that runs through that area. We have a wonderful rafting uh, economy, fishing economy, and those things depend on our beautiful forests and our unbroken landscape. Um, so it's incredibly important. The second reason, as Jeremy mentioned, is our own homegrown renewable energy industry. Um, we are, despite uh, attempts um, by the current administration and Central Maine Power, we are doing a great job growing our renewable energy industry. And um, this power line threatens that. It is going to cause um, congestion along our power lines and gonna make it much more difficult for renewable energy projects that are coming down the line. Um, every single capped landfill in the state of Maine is a great possibility to put a big, big old solar farm on it. Um, but, but if you haven't gotten in line yet, you're out of luck if CMP gets this line because it's gonna be very difficult and very expensive to tie into Maine's infrastructure if this line goes through. So we're, we're very concerned. Not only do we want to grow our renewable energy because it's, it's carbon free, it's, it's accountable, it's really easy to tell. We, we made it here in Maine, we can account for the electrons. Um, there's no question of whether CMP and Hydro-Quebec are, are adequately accounting for carbon emissions. Um, it also, you get tax revenue for the towns that host these sites. Um, there's jobs that go to Mainers. So there's a lot of other tan tangential benefits that are important for the state of Maine that we could lose out um, if we have this project. Um, and then finally is the, the larger carbon question. Central Maine Power is, is very precise about the way they talk about the carbon benefits to this and that it, it's accounting only in New England. So there's no accounting for outside of New England. Central Maine Power is selling, I'm sorry, <laughs> Hydro-Quebec is selling this power already. It's, it's out there. Um, 
what we're getting here is a dedicated line through the state of Maine for their power. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's new. This is, this is power that's already out there on the grid. So we're not getting an added benefit. It's just an accounting trick where we're looking only in New England. The power is being sold in other places. So we're, we're talking about emissions just in New England. Um, so that's my, that's my eleva elevator pitch, and I, I'd like to use the remainder of my time, if I have any, um, to address some of the things that were said during the presentation. Um, I'm actually incredibly excited um, to hear some of the things that um, Bruce said during his presentation. Um, we do have an enormous climate problem that we need to address, um, and it's going to be really hard, um, wicked hard. So we do need an all-hands approach. Um, we need to be attacking um, every single ability, every single little thing that we can do to address climate change. And I couldn't agree more. And I'm, I'm curious if um, the, the Northbridge urgency to decarbonize is actually represented, is actually a policy that Central Maine Power, Avangrid, and Iberdrola share. Um, and I asked that question because during the last legislative session, Central Maine Power opposed um, net metering, which would allow people to easily connect their rooftop solar to the grid. They opposed community solar, which would have allowed people who don't have the ability to put solar panels on their homes to um, band together with a bunch of other people and do, and do community solar. Um, they have opposed net metering. I mean, sorry, not, not net metering. They, they have opposed net metering, um, but they've also opposed um, non-wires solutions. So um, innovative technology, forward-looking technology to help um, blend together energy efficiency, renewable energy, and energy storage um, in creative ways to reduce the needs for, for poles and wires and expensive transmission upgrades. Um, these things are not the actions of a company that truly wants to address climate change. Um, the difference between promoting rooftop solar, non-wires alternatives, community solar, um, uh, electric vehicles, rapid electrical, electric vehicle adoption, the difference between those policies and what CMP is proposing is dedicated profits for their shareholders. And that's, and that's what this that's what this line has. In addition to um, what they've talked about, it's dedicated benefit for their shareholders. And that's money that goes in the shareholders' pockets and not in main ratepayers' pockets. Um, so I think, I think I can leave it there. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions. There's, there's a number of ways if citizens are concerned about this project to get involved. Um, there's ability to give public comment to the Public Utilities Commission. The docket number is 2017-00232. They can um, give public comment to the DEP or the LUPC. And then um, on NRCM's website, we have a petition that we are collecting signatures for. Um, so you can just Google NRCM NECEC petition. Um, we have over 2,600 people in the state of Maine who have signed on to our petition opposing Central Maine Power's proposed transmission line, and we're looking for more. Thank you very much. I was going to say, you could have said, let's go to NRC website. We'll get you all those numbers. <laughs> but thank you. So, and again, we'll come back around, and we're going to save questions. You're going to target questions. You guys may have some questions yourself. Let's uh, hear from um, David, AMC, please. Okay. Uh, can you go back to the, uh, the second slide bank? CMP's second slide bank. I think it has something to do with what goes on in the back room too, though, right? <laughs> and I believe it was either the first or second slide showing the root, choosing the root from. Yeah, no, that back one. Yeah, that one. Okay, if you can just leave that up. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks to Dot and Sierra Club uh, for having us. Uh, I'm Dave Publicover. I'm a senior staff scientist with the Appalachian Mountain Club. Uh, I'm actually based at, in New Hampshire but I do spend a lot of my time in Maine. Uh, the AMC is a regional conservation organization uh, with over 100,000 members in uh, a dozen, we're headquartered in Boston. We have a dozen membership chapters, uh, including one in Maine. Uh, with all due respect, I believe we're three years older than the Sierra Club. <laughs> hey, hey, <laughs> help me here. <laughs> And uh, among other activities, we own 75,000 acres of, of forest land in Maine, east of Moosehead Lake, which we manage for a combination of backcountry recreation, sustainable forestry, 
uh, ecological protection and, and community partnerships. So we do have a very strong interest in the main landscape. Uh, it was interesting to hear uh, Mr. Phillips say we have one chance to get this right. Uh, CMP had a chance to get this project right. Uh, they got it wrong. We, uh, as we develop our 21st century energy infrastructure, uh, we believe we should use 21st century technology, uh, which they have not. If you look at this map, and, and some of the concerns I express are going to be similar to what, what Sue said, they uh, indicate that, oh, there's all this valuable land to the north, there's all this valuable land in the mountains to the south, and they found the gap through the middle of it. Well, I challenge anybody to look at the main landscape and find that gap. It does not exist. This is a continuous landscape, and it is a globally significant landscape. Uh, this TNC has identified the western Maine Mountains region as part of the largest area of relatively intact uh, temperate hardwood and mixed forest in the world. Uh, it's one of the few places where you can find such an expansive area where almost every wildlife species that is supposed to be there is still there, uh, with the exception of things like, like wolf and, and cougar, which have which have disappeared. It is, uh, National Audubon has identified it as the largest nationally significant important bird area in the country. And it's true that a lot of it is commercial forest land, but as we said, forests grow back. And this would be one of the, one of the largest permanent fragmenting features across this globally significant forest region, uh, exceeded only by routes 201 and 26. Uh, so we have very serious concerns about the ecological impact of 53 miles of, of, of new corridor. Uh, we also have serious concerns about the impact on the Kennebec Gorge. Again, this is a nationally significant eco, uh, scenic and recreational resource. There are few specific places in Maine that have stronger protection in law and policy than the gorge. The Maine Rivers Act, Lepsi zoning, the site resource uh, Natural Resources Protection Act all call out the Kennebec Gorge as a resource worthy of a high level of protection. Uh, I also agree, agree with the rafter, uh, the raft guide, who said that this isn't just something you pass by floating on. This is a place where people spend time. After, you know, it, it's, it's at the upper part of the, uh, the more gentle part of, of, of that river corridor. People stop and spend lunch. Uh, uh, they spend time there. And this would be the most significant human intrusion on this otherwise uh, wild and undeveloped river corridor. And what's unfortunate is that these impacts are avoidable. They could have done the project differently. They could have buried the new corridor along existing roads, as other projects in the, uh, that are competitors in the mass RFP project have chosen to do. They can bury it under the gorge. We know that these options are technologically feasible. Uh, again, other, other, other projects have, have proposed them, including the late lamented Northern Pass, uh, who found it to be techno burying 60 miles of their corridor through much more difficult uh, areas, uh, was both technically and economically feasible, and the TDI line that goes through Vermont, fully buried, already permitted, with very little public opposition. Uh, so there are options. This project could be done better, and we think it's unfortunate that they didn't choose to do, do it. Uh, but as it stands, uh, as proposed, we are, uh, we are opposed to it. Uh, we have intervened in the DEP and LEPSI processes. Uh, and uh, again, we think this type of impact uh, using 20th century technology to create a 21st century energy infrastructure is inappropriate, unwarranted, and on balance provides uh, more impact than benefit. If they did it right, the economic benefits would still be there. <laughs> the jobs would still be there, uh, and the other benefits would still be there. So uh, I guess that's in the interest of time. That's all I will say. Very good. Of you. I give you a little, another minute, but no, I'm, I'm that's good. good. Now with uh... Uh, oh, let me just let me just say I, I <laughs> on the, the the main table out there, I have put a copy of a report that was done by uh, Janet McMahon, one of Maine's most respected ecologists, on the ecological values of, of this region and, and why it's more than just hammered industrial forest land. You know, we may take this region for granted, 
uh, because it's our backyard, and, but uh, it's a truly special place, and uh, we need to take better care of it. Uh, thank you. Hope I'm still on the microphone. Um, so you know, with the balance, anyone here? I'm going to say the same thing to the panel. The three speakers that just presented, would anybody like to pose questions to them as they wrap up to their wrap up? What am I, chop liver? What are you doing over here? You're supposed to be in the middle of bar. I'm not usually on the right either. So. <laughs> I'm sorry, my apologies. That's Link. fine. Uh, yeah, one minute. Yeah. No. <laughs> I thought I was among friends. Uh, I'm Lincoln Jeffers. I'm the Economic and Community Development Director for the city. And let me start with I think um, the future of our world is dependent upon finding alternative clean renewable power sources. It can't be tied to fossil fuels. And I think this Clean Energy Connect project is a good strong step in that direction. Uh, as the, I've been the Economic Development Director for the city for the past 18 years. Uh, and really, in my job, we've got a mantra. It's jobs, investment, taxes. This project hits all three of those. It's a $950 million project. Importantly, it's paid by people outside of the state of Maine. $250 million of that project will be in Lewiston. Uh, the DCAC converter station is going to be in Lewiston. Uh, I can tell you that, our, uh, that that $250 million investment will translate to 5 to $6 million of annual taxes in Lewiston. And Lewiston, that, that, that's enormous money. Lewiston was named the eighth best run municipality in the, in the uh, country uh, in large measure because we have uh, very efficient government services. Uh, our spending on a per capita basis is about half of what the other nine large communities in the state are, and yet we still have a very high tax rate. So this project is very important to Lewiston. Uh, I will say both our, uh, our city council unanimously endorsed it uh, with, with a resolution of support. Both the, our current mayor and our recent past mayor also are strongly in support of this project. All of that is my professional hat. And uh, let me take my professional hat off and say, personally, I put myself in the environmental camps. I'm a former river guide. I'm a former ski bum. Uh, my daughter is currently living that life out in Colorado. I am very... Uh, Tied to the environment, care deeply about it. I still think this project is the right project for Maine and the region. Uh, the, uh, as we look uh, in my notes here, I have, you know, should we take wind? Should we follow solar? Should we follow hydro? And Bruce Phillips beat me to the punch. And you put it much more eloquently than I would have. My answer is we, we got to do all of the above at the end of the day. Uh, all of these uh, have, uh, will have impacts and limitations. Uh, and w there's been quite a bit of talk from, from some of the folks who were opposed to the project about sucking up existing capacity in the current power lines. Uh, so what do we do? Just sort of say we've got capacity and we're never going to use it. We're just going to hold it in, in, uh, and, and, and hold it for somebody in the future who may be able to use it. There is existing demand today to use that. Uh, somebody is willing to pay to use it. Uh, there's the investment CMP has made as well as regional rate payers. So to say that... Uh, we should hold that and, and, and just sort of set it aside for some future use. When the time comes, future investments will need to be making at that time. Uh, we can debate back and forth. I think uh, Thorne's presentation, uh, which went through pretty quickly, but uh, I, I do think they took tremendous care in the siting of this project. Any uh, renewable power, uh, wherever it's sited, you've got to put a tra transmission line connecting it to the larger grid. So is everybody going to line up about against the next transmission line that's being expanded to connect some major offshore wind or some ridge top wind or some other project? I think, I think it's important uh, to really support these projects, recognize that if we like to flip the light switch um, and have the power come on and we want to have a future, it cannot be from burning fossil fuels. We really need to embrace all of the uh, renewable clean energy sources there are. Um, Quebec Hydro, I think there are questions. Or Hydro Quebec. Nice. Hydro Quebec. Hydro Quebec. I always get HQ and HQ. You know, I, I always back it up. I think I always want to call it the wrong way. In a presentation I heard them give, and I realize they're not here, and so I'm, I'm speaking. It's, it's hearsay for the attorney in the room. Uh, but really, their demand runs counter <coughs> to New England's demand. Most people in Canada heat with electricity because it's a very cheap source. 
So when their capacity is as at peak is when our electrical demand is actually down in Maine and the rest of New England. It, they only use about 25% of the capacity that they have in, um, during the summer months. Uh, they also have existing capacity in the dams that they've got up there. They spill very little water, but that is because they are building up the reservoirs behind the dams. So when the time comes, when there is increased demand, they can meet it. And it is also a consistent source of power as opposed to an intermittent source of power, which, again, I think we need to do wind. I think we need to do solar. I think we also need to do hydro. And there's a former river guide that does not come easily because I realize there are impacts. Uh, last couple of points, uh, CMP, I do have direct experience with these folks. I've been with the city since 2000. I have done about $145 million worth of projects with CMP uh, in Lewiston specifically. The Main Power Reliability Program has a major backbone of it. It is right here in Lewiston at the Larrabee Road substation. The converter station is going to be proximal. I, I, I'm not sure the exact distance. I would think it's within a half mile or so of, the, uh, of that uh, substation. So that's how it's going to connect going from direct current to alternating current and beyond to the larger grid. Uh, they listened to we, we, part of that Larrabee Road substation. We had a lot of residents concerned that the increase capacity running on the, on the power lines behind their houses, which they had grown accustomed to, hey, that's my backyard. Well, actually, it isn't their backyard. And so when somebody was going to actually cut trees on land that they owned, which is CMP's absolute right, uh, we had residents turn out, CMP listened, they were thoughtful, they changed the configuration and height of their poles, and they worked with us to really address uh, the, the concerns of the neighbors. Um, and they, we needed more power downtown, and again, CMP listened and really delivered on the promises on time, on budget. I think I'm out of time. And they got a little extra time. We've all been a little flexible. It was about six minutes, but go ahead. Uh, I think I've largely covered my points. Again, you saw you stuck over here with me. I didn't see you, but <laughs> let's do some questions. Any, anybody specific? Um, remember the podium, please. <laughs> if you could get to the podium right here at the end of this bench and put your and state your name. Yeah, please, sir. You were first. If, it's up to you guys back there. Somebody else? Hi, my name is Bob Rowe. I live here in Lewiston. I live in the neighborhood you're talking about, Lincoln, obviously. I haven't been part of the discussions that you described. I'm sorry, I wasn't because I'm very interested in this project. I, I live up near where the power lines come over the dam uh, in the neighborhood that's uh, called Michu Acres. And it's not far, it's less than a, uh, probably a half mile from the current news station, which would make it within a mile of the new substation. And I guess I have concerns about the generation of electromagnetic energy in that area. I also have questions about progress in general. It seems like we saw a picture of how the development would come in. Well, I was there when the substation came in. It kind of came down around and through existing corridors. And what's to stop this from, oh, uh, gee, we underestimated how much power Massachusetts needs. And suddenly, this is instead of a two tower line coming through, it's a four power line coming through. That could happen. It does happen repeatedly because people buy this notion that progress means more is better. And I'm not sure that once you build this line, there won't be more lines built through that corridor and the energy, as the energy need rises. So I'm, I'm very interested specifically why you see this is not a health threat in our area. And I'm also specifically interested in why you see it as something that uh, wouldn't be expanded in the future again. Thank you. Thank you. A couple questions. Anyone want to take that on? Uh, I was going to say, as far as the actual design and the EVM, that's really more CMP's um, expertise than mine. And as far as what the long-term build out. Plan. I mean, the, the uh, as I think we've talked about, and, and Sue had on a little bit, we, we still have a great many of approvals associated that we need to get through with this project. So no one should have the, the impression that uh, we are in the ninth inning uh, in this baseball game. We still have a lot of discussion and a lot of dialogue to have. 
that, you know, doing these kind of projects is incredibly complicated and challenging and takes a lot of time. So I don't, my own opinion is a, a transmission line coming into Lewiston is not going to make it any easier for a second uh, line to come into Lewiston. Right. H health impacts? Yeah. So on EMF, um, CMP has not done any of independent research on EMF. Um, it's been done by many others, including by the government. And to my knowledge, we're not aware of any studies that have shown a definitive link between electromagnetic fields and health impacts. But, you know, we encourage you to look and do your own research, look at the research that's been done, and see if, you know, you're comfortable with that, the results of that. Paul, uh, you might talk about EMF and, and how it falls off the distance. As I recall, it drops 50% every so many feet, and that was one of the reasons we redesigned the original line. To see. We, we have a rule about acronyms. E, M. Electromagnetic radiation. 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 Thank you. Uh, would you like me to answer that? Yeah. So I, I can't tell you the drop off, but it does attenuate as a function of distance significantly. I hope that was helpful. Your name. Um, my name is Julie Tibbetts. I'm a resident year-round in Otisfield, Maine. Um, in the summer, I'm a resident of T2R9, which is way up in the North County. Um, a bit of background for five glorious years. I was resident number 37 in the Forks of 38. <laughs> um, I have a couple of questions um, and one comment. My comment first, thank you for coming today, CMP. This could not be a comfortable room for you to be in, and I appreciate you coming and being available for us to ask questions. Um, I have a lot of them. I'm going to limit them right here. My first one may be easy. What is our time frame? What are we looking at? If everything were to go through as smoothly as central main power would love it to go through, uh, How many years down the, the line um, are we Well, this? I think the, uh, right now, our, if you look at our filings and our information that's out there publicly, what we're, what we're thinking about is all permits and approvals by the end of 2019, beginning instruction at the be end of 2019, beginning of 2020, and then uh, with a uh, completion in 2022 with a commercial operation date at the, at the end of 2022, beginning of 2023. Okay. Um, a, follow, a different question along another lines. Reading through the information I saw today and listening to you, you said 70% of the corridor that we are planning or you are planning is already existence, and 30% would still need to be either acquired or built. Is, am I correct um, in that? Pretty close. 72% of it is an existing corridor. That does, it means that we're going to build next to an existing line. So that portion of the line will involve about 75 foot of clearing but it will be a uh, clearing of a corridor that we own. So I, just to be totally clear, it's, a, it's, a, it's an existing corridor already owned by, by CMP and will be expanding 75 feet in, next to the existing line to put a, a new line in. The other corridor that we're talking about to the Quebec border is a, is a new owned right away or under the control of CMP. So we don't have to acquire anything. We've worked with the landowners in that area. Most of it is acquired. One piece of it is a long-term lease. That piece of it will be 150 feet of, um, of clearing. And as we said, there's different views on, on how to describe that part of the, of that part of the clearing. Our, our view is that it's an area that has already been currently impacted associated with logging. And obviously, we respect the view of other people who, who still see a great value around fragmentation um, avoiding. But, but that's kind of the, we own, a, we own the whole corridor. About 75 feet is going to need to be cleared next to an existing, and then 150 from the forks to the Quebec border. Okay, so the land that still needs to be worked up is all pretty much in one chunk. It's not a couple miles here, a couple miles here, all the way down to the coast. That's right. So the the every every part of the project that we're going to be building on is currently owned. Okay. Um, so we we own it all. In that, uh, Jerry talked about, it and we did kind of rush through it, but. It is predominantly two large landowners going from the forks there. And as Jerry said, it allows us some flexibility to try to avoid as many impacts as we can. And again, our, our opinion is it's an area that is already um, impacted. There are power lines that go across the river. Another company owns them. Was there any discussion with Brookfield about a merger or partnership that wouldn't require new lines going across the river when they're already at Harris Station and down at Wyman? 
It's a, it's a great question, and it's a, cash and, uh, a discussion that's currently going on right now in the DEP. We're, we're answering those questions within that process, both about going up to, um, all the way up to the dam, a different crossing location, and an underground design. As I said before, we're, uh, we don't think that the underground design is reasonable. We think that the overhead is the, the, the appropriate way that uh, balances impact and, uh, and benefits. But we're, we've also said that if we're required to, we'll do it. So, the the um, you know there is a lot of reasons that go into why they were challenges with um, areas where you currently can't build um, that can interfere with our ability to do it. What we're proposing is the, the the crossing we have, and like I said, the the questions you're asking are exactly the topic that's going on at the DP right now. Okay, thank you. Good questions. All set. Thank you. Um, I'm going to come, come back around in a minute, but uh, there was logistics I was supposed to share with everyone is that the rest <coughs> is out to your left. I feel a little late for that. I think I saw somebody looking a minute ago. Um, well, we're here for questions and answers. I was thinking that the panelists may have some questions and answers between each other that might be helpful. Go ahead. Yeah, I have a question and I, I, I do have a comment. Uh, you know, it's clear we have different uh, appreciation of the landscape in which this new corridor would go through. Uh, you know, we heard the same thing in Northern Pass, this new corridor, oh, it's already hammered industrial forest land, you know, what we're doing is no big deal. Uh, well, there's a difference, you know, timber harvests are temporary, they grow back, it's a mosaic of older forest and younger forest. But I think one, but, but the other point is that Ownership changes and management changes. And one only need to look at the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, uh, which used to be a couple hundred thousand acres of Champion International land, typical industrial forest land, a large uh, north-south power line running down from Canada, 150 foot wide corridor. Well, Champion sold that land <clears throat> and two big chunks of it went into conservation land. Part of it's part of the Conti National Wildlife Refuge and part of it uh, is part of the uh, state of Vermont's uh, wildlife management area. Those lands are being managed much differently. Uh, if there's harvesting, it's limited, you know, to wildlife management purposes. These, these, these forests are being restored to a more natural condition, but that corridor is still there, and it's going to be there for a long time, even if the rest of the forest around it is wilderness. So to say that, you know, this is, uh, uh, hammered industrial forest land, it's still forest land, it's still uh, relatively intact, and it's still capable of providing a wide range of habitat benefits. Uh, and I do have a question uh, for the CMP folks, is that this new corridor is going to be 150 foot wide. Uh, the right-of-way is 300 feet wide. Uh, can you say equivocally that that corridor won't be expanded to put another line next to it? Now, I could say with it that we have no current plans to utilize it. No current plans. Yeah. Okay. No, that's right. Which means it could happen. Yeah, I mean, it, one scenario that plays out is that um, we learn more and more about um, climate change that it is even a bigger risk. And whether it means wind from Quebec or, or that uh, some of the wind projects that, uh, that were proposed in other places in the region are brought forward. So this is a corridor. <coughs> that um, in the future can be utilized to solve uh, future problems. So why did you tell me that you had no plans to do that? I think I, I, think I said we have no plans to. I, I, that's exactly what I said. We have no plans for additional uh, work. We, if we were to do something else, we would have to begin the process that we've been you know, working on for a number of years all over again. I agree. The message, is, that's good. It was clear, I think. Yeah. It's, uh, it's there. Um, questions, either side. You just raise your hand. Sue, were you going to say something? I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. Um, 
I, I believe that, and I welcome you to respond. Um, the way that this whole project has been framed has been an either or. Either we accept that um, the only way to get uh, large scale hydro into the mix is for central main power to run a line creating a new 53 miles of corridor and beefing up the existing, the rest of the, the mileage or nothing. Um, and I, I would challenge you that that's a false choice, that there are existing inner ties in New England between um, Hydro Quebec and New England. And, and as you've said at the PUC, that those are, are, are at or near capacity. But there are other ways to, to beef up other inter ties between um, Hydro Quebec in Canada and the New England grid system. And then it doesn't have to be a brand new transmission line that's going to cut through Maine's forest um, versus nothing. That, that that's not the choice that's here. That's, that's the choice that CMP has, and that's the choice that CMP made when you bid into the Massachusetts RFP process. But that there are other ways to bring energy into the New England grid system. No, we agree. I mean, I think the competitive market, as I said, there were 51 bids, that creates innovation, um, efficiency, competition around that process. Now, we, we had no control over what that legislation looked like and what the evaluation process was. All we could do is propose ideas. Now, the, it, it was not an either or for us. We, we provided a basket of alternatives for, for Massachusetts. That included, I think, a total of six bids. Some of those included some hydro combined with wind, hydro only. Some of them were wind only. Some of them were solar with battery and wind. So we had six bids that had all different kind of creative ideas that we were excited about all of them. And to, to answer your point, some of those were Maine-based projects. Mo the majority of our bids actually were projects that were based in Maine. So in the end, the, the, the legislation, the way the process worked, the evaluation process that we were not a part of selected this project. So we're not saying either or, that was a selection that was made by Massachusetts. And uh, you know, we're, we're proud of this project. We think it's a great project. But we have a lot of other ideas. We have other ideas that we think also can go to this climate change. And, and Sue, I know you asked me a question, do we have goals or do we at the Ibadrola Avon Grid level? I just wanted to commit to you that you know, Ibadrola Avon Grid have a commitment to become carbon neutral by 2050, that 50% um, uh, CO2 emissions um, com by 2030 compared to 2007, and 30% um, emissions compared to 2007 by two 2020. So this is an important thing. It's and and I think we, I, you know, I know I am committed going forward to do everything I can to work together collaboratively to come up with solutions. If people didn't think that the legislation was right or the evaluation process right, I think there's opportunities on the next thing that happens to find a better way to do things. But we are where we are. I, you know, again, just to maybe just a, there were a couple of, one thing I would uh, um, point out is another area that I think both of us would agree to disagree is, uh, and, and Maine Renewable Energy also, is this area of congestion and, and, um, and um, whether this energy is actually um, uh, incremental. It's a, it's a tough question, and, it, and it, we've had a lot of dialogue at, at the Public Utility Commission. We believe that, that our project is actually creating additional transfer capability and that the congestion issue is not a problem, that actually it's lower congestion. And we also believe that all of this energy is actually incremental, not only to New England and Maine, to, but to, to the globe. And I know that's an area where we haven't been able to find common ground, but it is a, an area that I, I think we have to agree to disagree on. Please. Well, I've got three. Um, so we heard about the 1,700 jobs uh, on average over five years. Uh, I'm curious, and I'll, maybe I'll just run through three of them, sure. or, or I can stop, whatever is easiest, you tell me. I have um, a better memory if you do them one at a time. All right, so let's do, let's do the first one. So um, 1,700 jobs. Can you commit that 100% of those will be main, that, that will be made up of 100% main workforce? No. Why not? Well, because I think that there's going to be some some skill sets that are most likely going to be outside. I mean, part of that part of that 
That 1,700 is made up, um, which peaks at 3,500 in, in the period of time, is made up of both indirect and direct jobs. It was a study that was done by the University of Southern Maine um, to look at this. It actually benchmarks well against what happened in MPRP. So not only is this um, people that are going to actually building, building the project, but this is also uh, the restaurants, the hospitals, the other services along the area that also have jobs that benefit associated with it. So um, the w one thing that we found in MPRP, the $1.4 billion project that was built here in Maine, we were surprised how many um, journeyman workers there were that actually live in Maine that want to want to work on Maine projects but have to travel across across the country. And we also have very, very good construction companies within Maine that will definitely work on this project. But to guarantee it, I think the idea is we want the best people that are doing the best, whether it's safety and reliability and how they do things, we want the best people here. We know that a lot of those people won't be in Maine, but we would never commit to 100%. Do you have a sense? Do you think it's 10%, 90%? No, I, I, think, I think we were probably about 50-50 or so in um, the MPRP project. I'd have to, I'd have to check that out. I'm, I could see gonna, Sue thinking about a data request. So, <laughs> um, And then maybe I'll just run through these two because they're not yes. as complicated as that one. Um, so obviously you chose a DC line, direct current. So essentially the electrons grab on one end, and are delivered on the other. Why not an AC line? And, and for those folks who don't know the difference and why I'm asking, basically if you have an AC line that creates on and off ramps so that in-state generators could potentially tie into the line, and I can tell you from, from our perspective, that would address a lot of our concerns. And then last, um, I certainly understand why the city supports the project. It makes a lot of sense in terms of property tax and new tax. I thought you are going to let me, I'm going to forget the second oh, question. All right, go ahead, go ahead. Unless you yeah, let me answer it. So. So the, the issue on DC is a complicated one. People may not know that there's um, AC system, I think you can imagine as a, a, a shape that moves up and down. Quebec and, in New, and the US are not synchronized. So you cannot have an AC connection between those two systems. It just doesn't work. You have explosion damage to equipment because those two signals can't. The only way to interconnect them is through essentially a clutch that you have between them. And that means converting from AC to DC, back to DC, back to AC. Now you can, you can put those two converter stations right next to each other and have an AC line that goes all the way from Quebec all the way to the heart. But you lose about half of, you double the amount of losses associated with that. So by DC lines are about twice as efficient. They deliver, they have half the losses as AC. So trying to find the longest DC line that allows a connection to the furthest point and to the strong point of the system here in Lewiston is one, one reason why that, why that happens. The second one is um, Hydro-Quebec is, is buying all 1,200 megawatts of that transmission capacity. That's the size of the line. That's the capability of the line. The ISO in New England does not allow any feed into uh, the ISO for anything more than 1,200. So even if we built an AC line, there would not be able to be a connection into it. Um, so those are the, the two reasons. Okay. Uh, and then the last one, I'm not sure who should answer it, is, you know, as I started to say, I understand why the city of Lewiston supports the project that makes sense from your taxable value um, of adding more. But the reality is, I believe, you know, what, what, what would you say to say the town of Livermore Falls? You know, they've got a biomass plant there that employs a bunch of people, a bunch of loggers, truckers, foresters. What if they lose their job? So it's great for Lewiston, but what about for Livermore Falls? What about for Stratton? What about for a community that has one of these generators, whether it's biomass or hydro or otherwise, who potentially get bumped off and their projects are no longer viable? So our, our, and this goes back to a production cost simulation. It's, a, it's an incredibly complex uh, model that tries to uh, simulate the market for electricity. And the way it does it, by dispatching the lowest cost units to the highest cost units. Generally, on the margin, you see uh, natural gas and oil. So when we look over, our model predicts a significant amount of generation that will no longer run, that's gas and oil. That's, for, for people that care about climate, that's a good thing. That's about moving towards decarbonization. It's taking that carbon out of the atmosphere. We've, in our model, we looked at is, is a project that was currently um, passable, was not gonna be retired in Maine, 
as a result of this project, and this goes to a side point, which is this idea of lower energy prices for customers that we talked about, that also means that the generators are going to see lower a sales price. So the, by um, not doing this project, their money is going to essentially flow from the pockets of customers in New England to the generators. And if, so the, those generators are going to run less. And uh, our model says for Maine, none of the projects move from a category of being um, projects that wouldn't retire to being retire. Um, so we don't see this project having an imp impact of retiring on any project in Maine. And uh, London Economics that did the work for the Public Utility Commission also came to that came same conclusion. I think they found some projects in the Connecticut would, that would retire. Can I ask a, like a follow-up? Oh, please do. So I, I, I recognize that that's what your modeling showed. I just want perhaps to give the other side of of the story that there has been testimony in the Public Utilities Commission that indicates that under new ISO rules, the way that the the way that the energy market is looked at, that it that it may be that this project will not clear the forward capacity market and will result in closures within the state of Maine. And that's been an, an alternate theory that's put out there that would actually cause have an end result be more closures of plants in Maine. Just so I make sure, because I thought that maybe maybe we're misunderstanding each other, but I thought the debate was whether NECC will clear the capacity market. I'm sorry, what did I say? I thought you were saying whether the other projects that no, whether the NECC would would clear the forward capacity. So market. you're so, so if, there's if, there's two prongs to that. So first is that you wouldn't get the forward capacity benefits that are part of the money benefits that you think would come to ratepayers. And the second piece of that is that we would see Maine be modeled as its own energy pocket. So from an energy perspective, again, it, this is, uh, we get to a point, I think, Sue, of inside baseball. And, and I think in the fairness of the dialogue, I think um, these are complex markets. Our view is we don't see any congestion on the energy market. We do see price suppression. Price suppression means less revenue for um, oil and gas generators, and it means more savings to customers in New England. So that's, we don't see congestion happening in our, in our approach, and again, that's our view. On the capacity side, if the NECC does clear the market, and I think the, I think the generator groups are arguing that it won't, um, then your right, point is right. If it clears, there'll be a, a reduction in the capacity market that will mean savings to customers. If it doesn't, if, if it doesn't clear, customers' prices will be higher, the generators will um, make more money. So that's the trade-off here and what happens. And I, my understanding in the testimony <coughs> is the capacity was the hardest one to demonstrate. Was, there was the most uh, disagreement on how it, how it might play I'm out. I'm gonna stop you there. A little, okay. little, little technical. Yeah. Um, do, was I wrong though, did I hear kind of in my opinion and in my opinion, did I just hear that? In our findings and in our findings? So it wasn't my findings, far above my pay grade. <laughs> but it was alternate testimony that was put in front of the public utilities which, which indicates that CMP's estimates may be about two thirds overstated if their capacity market Analysis is not correct. Yeah, sort of an agree to Look disagree at, moment again. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I heard that one. I'm just fair, uh, it's fair. trying to get down to a, a sentence that we might be able to understand. I think I've got some people a few other questions. You sat here for yeah, yeah. turn over here. Yeah. Um, again, my name is Becky, um, and I um, was interested in some of the um, some of your slides. One of which was the um, the pros and cons. Sure. And um, I noticed that um, you did not have either energy efficiency as part of the mix. Um, uh, of solutions, um, I guess that was you actually, Brian, that didn't seem as though there was any efficiency listed on that. There's no microgrids on that. And I'm really curious as to how you would answer the issue. We've just heard that the Russian, you know, Russians have ability to hack into ISO New England. It seems to me that distributed generation and local, um, local energy sources rather than, um, you know, uh, big ISO New England transmission lines are um, actually going to be much safer and much more secure. So I'd like to hear what you have to say about that. Sure. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Uh, so on 
Russian hacking, it's, that's way beyond my pay grade. So uh, I, I, you know, other than I share your concern, I can't really, can't really say anything of any, any substance about it. Um, on, on the energy efficiency question, um, uh, I, I, maybe in, in, in my effort to kind of uh, get through the slides quickly, um, I skipped over the point, but it is in the second part of the analysis that I talked about. When I ticked through that list of nine technologies, um, and, and one of them, oh, here it's a customer demand response. It's number nine on the list. Customer demand response includes energy efficiency, energy management, uh, uh, all, all sort of, a whole cluster of things. And um, it's an important part of the solution. There's, there's no doubt about it. I mean, appliance standards uh, that have been uh, you know, developed and implemented through government regulation have had a tremendous impact as has have state and utility energy efficiency programs. Um, but if you recall the slide, we, we had um, uh, customer deficits in, in the summer season that were half of electric load, right? So we may be able to save 5%, 10%, 15% through continuing energy efficiency numbers. I, I'm, I'm not sure what the potential is, but I don't think we can count on saving 50% of, of, of customer load through energy efficiency. So um, just do you know about the Booth Bay project, the microgrid project, where they actually created ice um, in the summer with their solar and, and reduced the amount of energy that was required and the transmission line cost? Do you know about that project? I do not. Okay. I think it would be worth looking at it. I will. Thank you. I just a, just a one, one thing. In those nine, wouldn't you assume that in those nine things, whether it's the rooftop, solar, battery storage, um, those are all critical parts of microgrids. So do you, would you see those nine things as eliminating microgrid, that the microgrids are not part of your nine solutions, or is that another way of enabling it in your mind? So. Yeah, you know, I think, um, so, so if you sort of look through that, you know, number three in the item uh, is solar PV that includes both, both utility scale central station, you know, which is not microgrid, but the rooftop, you know, would be. Um, and um, uh, battery storage can be in front of or behind the meter. That's part of many standard kind of microgrid systems. Um, and so I think, I think you're right that, that the fair bit of the, the microgrid is, is, uh, is, is built in there. And, but let me just come back to, 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 the, to the core point from there, which is that um, I would not dispute that on paper we can create a lot of systems that, that might work. The question is whether we can do it with enough reliability that we want to put all of our eggs in, in one basket as a pathway to, to decarbonize. I'm, I have no problems with microgrids. I, I think pursuing them is, 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 you know, is well worthwhile as every item on that list of nine. I'm just saying makes me uncomfortable counting on only those nine as a way to deal with the climate problem. I think we ought to look broader. I'll quit. Can Please. I just quickly weigh in on that as well? I mean, I think, I think it makes sense on a residential basis, but on an industrial basis to have on demand, you know, I need a gazillion watts to run some, some piece of equipment. Are you really going to be able to handle that long term in an area without wind, solar, and doing that with battery backup? I don't think you can. I think you need hydro to meet that kind of demand. <coughs> so. Agreed. Your name, please. Scott Kelly, Phippsburg, and I'm on the executive committee volunteer with the Sierra Club. I want to thank all of you for coming. For me, it's as if you came just to educate me as well as the people here, and that's been delightful. Three small points or questions. I'd like to start with Bruce Phillips because I hadn't heard his presentation before and agree that this is a huge kind of question. I just want to understand, you said we had 3% wind and solar, and in your chart where you showed that we were exceeding what we need in the winter and a big deficit in the summer, was that dependent on your mix of solar and wind? Because solar seemed to be big in the summer, wind big in the winter, and so I'm just wondering how much adjustment you took for what wind you assumed and what solar you assumed? Yeah, so that's, 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 that's a great question. Uh, thank you. Um, and basically, we, uh, 
wind and solar, to, or in 2017, there were a little bit more than 3% combined, as you said. Uh, so what we did is we scaled up that, those patterns for wind and solar um, so that the, the total amount of wind and solar megawatt hours equaled annual electric load in, 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 in New England. Uh, so we did make a, a assumptions about how much to scale up wind and how much to scale up solar. Um, uh, in both cases, it was roughly 30 to 35 times. Um, uh, and um, uh, we could have done it differently, but, but the, 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 the methodology that we chose was to minimize the cumulative, the total amount of surplus and deficit over the course of the year. Um, so, you know, we could have we could have gotten more wind, you know, and less solar, or you know, the reverse. Um, and uh, you know, the the actual numbers on the chart would have been the same. But the 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 only way to to eliminate that deficit in the summer with just with solar and wind, um, given, given that the, you know, the, the, the solar is not going to be producing electricity in the middle of the night, um, would be to dramatically increase the amount of wind that, that, uh, th that we had. And so instead of producing the same number of megawatt hours over the course of the wind, we might have had to, I don't know what it would have been, say double it or triple it, you know. Um, and, um, and of course, there's lots of impacts associated with the, the uh, you know, the transmission and, and, uh, and development of renewables associated with that, too. Did uh, I did I answer your question? That was very good. Okay. Uh, so I'm a little confused okay. because t I do believe that from that solar and wind and storage. And I look at hydro. Hydro is a good storage. You say that that's what Hydro Quebec is doing. That's what pumps. Uh, hydro would also do but it's a very it's it doesn't require as much um hydro as as base loading and bringing in you know the huge number and so it's in canada i must admit that i don't find that it's the best solution so and i when i looked at your slide that one i was wondering if you would worked with the solar and the wind differently that with of percentages that you would have actually recommended much more solar because it's not as effective and it needs to be in the summer and that's where you had your lowest ping and and take the wind down and have more solar uh, have more storage and i think that just to summarize i think that's what i've heard that the project is not a horrible project but that uh it has been done maximizing the profits to, uh, you know, Hydro-Quebec perhaps and, and uh, CMP and that the people that you've heard have suggested that there are things that really need to be in this project as well. So the other two questions, and I'll do this very quickly. I'm watching the clock, Bob, please. No, okay, then I'll uh, not go there. I just wanted to highlight that, that, that that 40 million, at least in conversations we've had to inform people, might be two thirds less if it doesn't clear the uh, capacity market. Is that true or is the 40 million assuming it doesn't clear? The 40 million is just an energy number. So it has, it's totally unrelated to the capacity estimate. So the, the 40 million number is really just um, a question of what your gas price is in the future, what the load is, what the dispatch, and how that resolves, and, and also whether or not there's congestion. And those things will affect that, but not the capacity clearing. That won't have an effect. OK, and then my last one is the EMF, which I think is a very important one. And it is Lewiston. So we held this in Lewiston. And I think in part because I was thinking that you might talk about the impacts in Lewiston. And I would just encourage you to actually estimate and provide useful information to people um, hopefully showing that it's well within, you know, acceptable levels. So thank you. Um, are you in, in line for questions? Please. Can I just make one super quick comment about the assumptions? Just if there's anything, I've been doing this for 10 years. If there's anything I've learned, which is I'm sure a lot less than everybody else up here, but if there's anything I've learned in my 10 years as it relates to energy projections, it's not a matter of whether you're going to be right or wrong. You're definitely going to be wrong. It's just a matter of by how much. 
So whatever numbers any of us put out there, we're going to be wrong. Uh, I 100% agree with that. Just, just so everybody knows that. This is a, in the inside baseball, they call this dueling, dueling models. Mm -hmm. So it's a, always an aspect of forecast. Please. So you Your agree name. to agree. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, uh, my name is Ed Buzzell. I'm from Moxie Gore, Maine. Uh, I live right on the access road, which the project is going to be using or utilizing to, uh, to be able to build a lot of this project. Uh, my question is for Jerry, I guess. Uh, it's about the Kennebec Gorge. I read in the, in the papers that you wrote, I guess, uh, that the Kennebec Gorge is not a gorge, or the lower Kennebec Gorge is not a gorge, and it's not pristine. And I'd really be interested to know how you came to that conclusion. Okay. Uh, well, uh, the question was for him. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Jerry's the one who said that, please. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that, I'm that's sorry. Me. That is Jerry. Jerry. Yeah. I've got that is Jerry. Yeah. Okay. Um, the uh, the reason that we said that was because there's a a couple of reasons. One is that there's a guidebook that identifies the gorge as restricted to the first three and a half miles below Harris Dam. So it's not yeah. really our definition of the gorge. It's it's more like the the guidebooks. And I and I can't recall the name of the guidebook, but I can get you that um, after the presentation if you like. Um, and if you think about a gorge as a, a steep walled canyon, the, the area that's proposed for the aerial crossing is not that. You know, it certainly has topo to it, but it's not exposed ledge, it's not vertical walls. Okay. Yeah, and, and uh, nothing that any of us should say um, should come off is that we don't recognize the beauty of the gorge and that this is a, this is a, uh, and the river, I should say more correctly. Uh, and this is, a, this is one of those things that are a trade-off and balance uh, that, that, that we have, and that's an important part of the dialogue with the DEP right now. Well, again, definition of a gorge. Uh, I took a 67-year-old man. He only, you know, he only kayaked the lower section of the gorge because it was easier for him to do. And I took him down uh, the day before yesterday. And I'd hate to tell him that what we went through was not a gorge. And it wasn't pristine. And it, he also told me he kayaked a lot out in Colorado, and most of the rivers that he'd kayaked out there, they had some form of human intervention, such as a house or power lines along that line. He was very impressed with his trip. The other question I have is, you said this uh, won't be going until the 2019, you won't be building anything? So the, the, we, the, uh, we expect, we, we, there's no, construction can't start, actual what we consider construction until um, all permits and approvals are required are, are done in the, in the matter of time let me answer that question basic oh. best case scenario 2020 2020 okay well, okay like i said i live on the access road uh the only tar road up to um, moxie pond and that road is being heavily heavily redone completely a rock bait and i've lived up there i built the camp in 95 i've been up there for 40 years I have never ever seen that road. Usually they just throw a piece of tar on it and that's, that's it. This road has been built up over a foot. I tried to mow my lawn the other day. I couldn't even begin to mow down by the road unless I had an ATV to mow it. Uh, so I'm just wondering, you're saying 2020, but somebody's building that road up for heavy trucking right now. Hmm. Now that, that's not, a, that, there's not, if something's being done, to, you're talking about Trotdale Road? No, I'm talking about the Moxie Lake Road. Yeah, there, there, there. We would, you know, we should talk after just to make sure we get. But I am certain that associated with this project, there's no work that we're doing on any roads. Um, we won't do that until we get all the permits and approvals we need. Well, it certainly has a rock base under it now, uh, and I'm not complaining about do, you know having a good road up through there. But definitely, <laughs> we've needed it for a long time. Well, let, if you can uh, give me the information after, we'll look into it just to make sure that there, there isn't any confusion with another project. Or. Well, I guess that leads to another question is, I've been asking for like six months for a detailed topographical map. And uh, I haven't got it yet. And in fact, at one of the other meetings I was at, I asked for that, you know, that map. A project of this size, you would think for the public, I mean, it, it, it really affects the abutters on this project, or it affects people to go fishing, whatever. And uh, there is no map. The maps that I've seen look like a fourth grader did them. I mean, well, we a project have, like this needs to have a good topographical map drawn so that people can understand where yeah, it goes. We, I mean, we try to get out to everybody in the community. We held a, a meeting in the Forks um, with the whole community around where you live 
we had actually an eight foot um, long uh, high visual aerial picture that showed exactly where every pole was on it. It was laid out across the whole. I, I was there at that meeting. Oh, okay. Yeah, and uh, no, I didn't see that, I guess. Which there, there were two meetings in the Forks. No, I've, I've been asking for a topographical okay. map. Topographical hey, look, map. well, I'll yeah. give you my card. Let's yeah. make sure you that get what you want. That solution. Good idea to come here tonight because mm -hmm. you got a one-on-one -on -one right there. Well, I asked once and I didn't get it. So. I, now you got right. a little closer, we got a smaller group. I, I do believe we're getting towards the dead end time at, uh, at our uh, host no, it isn't. community. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Hello, yes, my name is uh, Carl Shaleen and uh, uh, Lewiston business owner, Lewiston uh, property tax uh, payer here. And, uh, you know, I would just like to offer some, some comment and perhaps some perspective. Um, you know, if I, you know, with anything, there's going to be impacts, right? And um, there's going to be trade-offs, you know? And if I, if I told you about this wonderful idea I had that, you know, we should build this huge industrial complex on the coast, um, you know, there, there might be a lot of opposition to that. And then, um, oh, wait, I have another great idea. If we had this industry that, where we would just string multicolored buoys all along the coast of Maine, it might be, um, you know, uh, there might be some, uh, uh, some opposition to that. But I, I don't think anyone could argue that Bath Iron Works and um, the lobster industry has been net, po you know, while I'm sure there are impacts, um, they have been net positives for Maine. And I think this project is going to be a net positive. Um, you know, this is not, you know, I think we need to, you know, yes, we're going to be um, cutting down a really a minimal swath of, of land that's, you know, I saw the photos outside, you know, those, a lot of the trees are already gone, and yes, you know, it's forest and it will grow back, but unless I'm under, not understanding everything correctly, as soon as the forest grows back, the logging company will, you know, cut it back, right back down again. I mean, that was the whole idea. And it's, you know, this is, you know, put things in perspective, this is not a pipeline that's going to leak. And I think it's, um, yeah, I think it's going to be uh, beneficial for the world at large and um, certainly uh, northern New England and, um, you know, and, and for Lewiston. And, you know, as a, as a business owner, you know, you know, sometimes profit is okay. It's what makes the world go round. And I think it's ironic to complain about CMP and um, their profits. You know, I'm, not, I'm under the impression that river tours are not free and that um, as they certainly must uh, provide some, uh, some impact to this pristine wilderness. Um, no offense to anyone here, but just to offer some perspective. Thank you. So uh, Jeff McCabe again from Skowhegan. I, I didn't state before that I've been a recreator in the Kennebec Gorge since 1996 and a commuter to the Forks since around 2000, 2001. So everybody else that lives there, drive by Ed's house, Kim's house, see Julie there frequently. Uh, a couple questions. I took the time to go out and grab your sheet and I didn't know if anywhere available maybe in the plan and I can talk to folks uh, at the state, but at this point in time with a project so far along, is there actual footnotes to some of the figures in here or statements? And if so, I'm just going to run through a few. And, you know, I'd be curious as far as the support from elected officials. And I can just ask you to hit, the, hit your targets because we're sure. way past our time. So now. figuring out who those supporters are uh, as it relates to the Hydro-Quebec in providing uh, energy. Is there an agreement in place, a written agreement, that it will be hydropower only to meet this demand? Uh, in, as it relates to the new line that will also be fiber optic cable, is there a written agreement on that? And if so, it, can we sort of get a footnote to that? Uh, and then the other piece too, I read about the New England Clean Power Link and that project and, and the cost of that project. And it seems that this meets Massachusetts goal, moved away from there quite some time ago, uh, in providing you know, cost effective alternative and I've heard figures thrown around the mitigation around this and, and some of the money that will go to the Forks area. But I imagine at this point in time, I recognize that these are all hypothetical until this project's built. But there seems to be some use for this money in place. And I just wonder if there's a list of those projects, uh, trail improvements and those sorts of things, these you know, benefits that exist. So just so I understand, uh, let, let's go, uh, I think, back to the first one. The, there is an agreement in place. Uh, they're both now publicly available. Okay. Um, 
the, there's, a, there's two agreements. One is between Hydro-Quebec and the electric distribution companies in Massachusetts the, where the costs will be borne uh, from the project. And then there's a separate agreement between uh, Central Maine Power and the EDCs in Massachusetts. Both of those agreements are available. They're not a, probably an easy read, uh, but, uh, but they're both there. They do require very specific monitoring of the portfolio of, of hydro assets to guarantee that the power coming over is hydro. Um, the, the second question was on, well, the, I remember the third one. Yeah, the, yeah. The third one was on, um, oh no, the second one was fiber optic. Yes. Yes. So there is an agreement in place that we, we have to put um, uh, fiber optic. Uh, it's actually something that makes a ton of sense um, for the project. We, are, we would have to have some amount of fiber optic on the poles anyway. So what we've committed to do is provide a, a ton of fiber optic uh, cables to be able to help reinforce and maybe even serve new areas in Franklin and, and Somerset counties. But no broadband, Our, sir, no provider? No, no, so right now the commitment in, in the agreement that we have is the, to, str to string all 150 miles of this additional fiber optic cable to be able to serve there and potentially even connect in Quebec with the U.S., which may have some additional benefits. But we're in conversations with Franklin County and Somerset about how can we utilize that fiber optic in a way that can bring value to the communities. Okay. Um, and then the last thing is the, um, I think you believe, believe you're referencing the Western Mountains and Rivers Agreement, and that is an agreement that's out there publicly available. If, it, if you can't find it, we're happy to email it to you, and it provides the, you know, some things are very specific, some, some, some things are very general. Uh, you know, once you, it's, it's, a, it's an easier document than the ones that were filed in Massachusetts. It's probably 20-ish pages long. Uh, we're happy if you have questions about any specific clause to... to sure, to, no, it would be helpful for this type of event. I think sure. people could see that. And then, you know, folks that might be left out would also recognize that... Yeah, yeah, sure. You know, I, I'd be happy to... If, sure. if, let's exchange cards. Absolutely. We'll, we'll get the topo map and we'll uh, make sure you yeah. get the, uh, the agreement. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Ed, and, but in that exchange, uh, you raised your hand. You're not at the podium, remember, so... Okay, I'll get that answer in a minute. Go ahead, Ed. I, I see every, everybody on the panel seems to be in agreement that we need to get to uh, carbon-free generation and electricity in the, in the system. And that preferably we do that by the middle of the century. You know, the West is burning, the East Coast is drowning. Uh, we've got a lot of problems to deal with. It, it, some people would say that we were facing an existential threat. There are groups that are against everything. There are groups that oppose that installation of wind, whether it's on a mountaintop or whether it's in the ocean. There are groups that seem to be against every possible option. So a question I ask for the panel is, if not this project, how do we accomplish that in the environment that we're in where people are against virtually everything? Uh, Sue, you want to address that? Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> we're not against everything. Uh, there have been 30 some odd wind power projects in New England that have come before permitting agencies. We've opposed two of them in their entirety. I'm not saying you, okay. I'm just saying somebody is against everything. And we are not saying this project should not be built. We're saying this project should be built better. Spend a little extra money and do it right. Minimize the worst impacts in ways that are technologically and economically feasible. They're constrained by their current bid to Massachusetts. It's really not our problem. There are ways to get, you know, we're agnostic on Quebec Hydro right now. Uh, I'm not saying whether it should or should not come to New England. Uh, we recognize, you know, the climate, potential climate change benefits of it. We think they need to be better demonstrated. But spend a little extra money and minimize the worst impacts Bury the new, rather than creating a new swath through this highly significant forest, bury it along existing logging roads. Bury it under the gorge. Spend a little extra money, do it right. That's all we're saying. So the idea of being for or against? 
Sure. So, so we are opposed to this project. Um, the Natural Resources Council of Maine is is not opposed to all projects. We've supported um, a number of solar projects recently. We also supported the um, the Aquaventus, the Maine Aquaventus project, which was um, just sent back to the drawing board by the Public Utilities Commission here in the state of Maine and the governor. Um, so there's lots of ways to get there. There's offshore wind, there's onshore wind, there's solar, there's battery, there is distributed generation, there's energy efficiency. That's how we can get I'm there. Not accusing you. <laughs> I'm just saying that for every project you mention, there will be people who oppose it. Yep. And that, that opposition, whether you're for or against any individual project, has an overall long-term impact on how far we move. That's, I would like to wrap it up with that. I, and I want to agree with Ed because I've been in the State House and watched CMP oppose a lot of good projects. So everybody opposes something. Everybody so I think I'll, I'd like to put it at a wrap on that if that's okay with everyone. Are you okay at the table here? <laughs> sure. <laughs> you, st you started off with one and ended with one. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much, oh, yeah. gentlemen. I got one card sitting around there, oh, so yeah. I'll give it to you in case you want to take that. Gentlemen, that was good. I liked what you say. I, I would like to apply it to other programs. <laughs> <laughs>